full name. My name is Charles Theodore Jacobs. Thank you. On this bright afternoon of March 15th, in the year 2005, Charles Jacobs, a World War II Navy veteran who served in the Pacific, is being interviewed by Neil O'Shea, a member of the Veterans History Project team at Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. Mary Ellen Essek, Mark O'Brien, and Kate Olicki are the other members of the Veterans History Project team. The team would like to thank Chuck for being our first veteran to be interviewed. This interview is being conducted in the children's program room. Actually, we've switched it. It's being conducted in the group study room here at the Niles Library at 1.30 on the afternoon of March 15th. Chuck is a perfect first interviewee as he is not only a colleague here at the Niles Public Library, but he also maintained a diary throughout the war and as part of this interview experience is providing the National Project uh, with a copy of his diary. Very nice. <laughs> so Chuck, um, what did you do before you joined the service or how did that come about? Well, I was a student. Um, I was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin, went to St. George Parochial School there into the public high school, uh, Kenosha High School. And uh, uh, I graduated in June of 1943. And of course, at that time, the war had already been in progress for two years, approximately two years. and. Uh, very many of my friends and relatives and neighbors were already in service uh, because nearly everyone, as soon as they finished high school, went into one of the branches. Uh, I had a brother, Peter, who was training to be a naval flyer, and I have had a sister, Catherine, who was a in the WAC, the Women's Army Corps. So I was the third in my family, which gives you an idea you know, of how widespread this thing was. There, um, so um, in September of that year, I volunteered for the Navy, and that's where it all began. Was your um, brother also in the Navy? Or? My brother what? Was, did you have a brother in the Navy also? Yeah. 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 Right. So that, that helped to make you... He was trained to be a naval flyer down in Florida. And when, when I was subsequently stationed down there, I saw him quite often. And uh, then, uh, strangely enough, when I went out to the Pacific, my brother was there right near where we were through most of the Okinawa campaigns. So where did you go for, for training then or okay, induction? So, uh, I went to the Great Lakes Naval Station, which is about 25 miles from Kenosha, where I was living, my hometown. And uh, while there, I uh, was put in the Hospital Corps School. And the Great Lakes Naval uh, Hospital is right there. And uh, that's where I received my basic training to be a, a Navy medic. So, uh, now, that's where the Navy placed you, was it in the, yeah, the Medical Corps? Or, right. Yeah. That's, uh, where I was placed. Was that ba on the basis of a particular aptitude test or your grades yeah, in high school or biology? Yeah, everybody tests of all types and then they decided where you might fit in well, you know. So I ended up in the uh, hospital car, it was called. And following the training uh, at the uh, Naval Air, I mean the uh, Great Lakes Naval Base, uh, I was sent to 
Florida for nine months to the amphibious training base at Fort Pierce, Florida in the hospital. There were about, as I recall, about 15,000 sailors there training uh, for all types of landing activities, amphibious training. And uh, there were, they had a hospital. We all, uh, everybody lived in tents, or the whole base was a tent, tent base. Uh, few, if any, permanent buildings there, you know. But it was, was a, an island just off across the river from Port Pierce, Florida. Must have been a new and different experience for a recent high school graduate from the Midwest to be so far away and then training with people from, I would imagine, from all around the country and all types of people. Well, one of the reasons that I chose the Navy was that, you know, I, I'm crazy about traveling and I wanted I figured this would be an opportunity to travel. My dad was in the uh, army in World War One in France, and he said, "If you, uh, if you're going to service, I I recommend the navy. <laughs> you always have a roof over your head, and you have, have your food, and you know it be nice." So uh, that's couple of the reasons that I ended up in the Navy, I guess, and that they took me in the Navy. So, so after the, the training in, in Florida, you were assigned to a ship or? Yeah, I, I, we were down in Florida for approximately nine months. Then in November of 1944, uh, I was sent to Yes, to Boston uh, and uh, became a crew member on the USS Sims. So that's, uh, at the time the Sims had been, just been uh, recommissioned as an APD. Prior to that, the ship was a destroyer escort in the Atlantic, they did uh, uh, escort duty mostly, I think, of tankers and ammo ships. Eh? Well, of, of the, um, uh, what do they call the groups of ships in the Atlantic uh, uh, convoys. And they convoyed, uh, I think this was mainly tankers and had down to Curacao. And then they made several trips to Northern Ireland. And then uh, about that time, uh, the war was nearly three years old at that time uh, for the U.S. Uh, the U-boat Venice was taken care of in the Atlantic, so they decided to convert uh, part of these. There were approximately 500 uh, destroyer escorts built, they should starting in. 1941, 42, I imagine it's. But anyway, uh, they decide to convert a limited number of them for for transporting troops and for uh, they could continue uh, escort duty and anti-submarine. We still still had. They took off our torpedo tubes, but they put. It they left the ash cans, you know, for dropping on, on contacts. Uh, they took, we had a five inch gun as a destroyer escort, or a three, two three inch guns and smaller guns. And they put on all these twin uh, 40 millimeter guns around the ship and a five inch gun on the bow, which was a pretty pretty good sized gun for, for a 200 uh, foot, 300 foot ship. So uh, then they, they took uh, all of the uh, Y guns and the, the launchers for anti-submarine off the ship and, and 
housed that all in for carrying troops. So we could carry, uh, we had a crew of about 200 and we could carry about 200 passengers of one type or another, either troops or whatever. So how long after you were inducted before you set out to sea on your on the Sims? Well, um, it wasn't very long. This was the middle of the winter. This was November, uh, I forgot what, November 20th or something like that when I you know, went to, when I went aboard uh, the Sims. And uh, we did some uh, training cruises out in the Atlantic midwinter, and that was pretty hairy, because, but the cold and the waves and everything, that was my first experience actually with sea. But I, I, it didn't bother me at all. And, uh, then we went down to uh, Norfolk and we did some training of other uh, APD crews because uh, a large part of our crew uh, was already, they were already seasoned sailors because of these trips in the Atlantic to uh, prior to this on the DE. And so they, they knew how to handle the DE, the ship that was essentially the same except, you know, we had, we, we could carry troops and different armament and things like that. So then, uh, so we were down around the Norfolk area for a bit, and then uh, I I forgot what dates we shoved off for. It. We loaded up, and, and we have also had gunnery practice, you know, out in the Atlantic. So and then we took took aboard. Uh, I don't know how many, 100 or 150 Marines and, 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 and started headed for Panama. We had a very nice cruise, beautiful weather down through the Caribbean to, to Panama. Uh, the first uh, landing in Panama was at Cologne at the, at the east end of the canal. And that was a really wild uh, liberty night, you know. <laughs> I, I went to Clarman. I was. They left me on board. I never got ashore in Panama. And, uh, but anyway, uh, the the cruise through the canal was wonderful, beautiful, and, uh, historic, of course. Everything. So at this time, you you have a formal uh, office or duty or responsibility oh, on the yeah. ship? No. Right, right off the bat, of course. I, I was busy most of the day, although I did get a little time to do some sunning down through the Caribbean. But just, since we had uh, our passengers, plus our crew, there were about 350 people. Uh, by the way, there were three of us in the medical department. There was a Dr. Kellum, a lieutenant, and there was a uh, chief pharmacist made by the name of Mobley from Alabama. So there, we were three, three people and then I was, of course, uh, uh, at that time I was a hospital. Uh, I, I'm not sure I was, uh, what my designation was, first, first, uh, first class I think at that time. Uh, in addition to um, Corman. serving as a hospital corpsman in this three-person medical department, did you also have um, duties that might involve like gunfire? Or? No, we we were spared pretty much from from any from other duties because there were plenty to do. You know, in the sick bay, where every three times a day we we'd, we'd have a sick call. And there, that might last for hours, and again at noon and in the evening, and that, then there were minor operations and injuries and 
things like that. So uh, it wasn't, uh, we, we didn't stand uh, duty, you know, uh, like every, all other crew members had, had certain duty, although we had the sick, sick day duty. And, but uh, there was some time in between we, we to play cards, we played a lot of pinochle. The, the big part of the crew, of course, was into poker, and they played poker games down in the, in the uh, bottom of the ship, down in the fields of the <laughs> um, You have an excellent memory and a command of the details. Um, and I would suspect that that's been aided to a degree by the fact that you kept a journal or a diary during the war. And I'm curious to know when you decided to, to keep the diary and, or to Well, I actually, I, I kept a diary from the time I went into service. So I have another year where, when I was in Florida and all that, that I never typed up or never taken out, never read, in fact, in 60 years. So, uh, someday I think I'd like to put that on paper too. Were you involved in high school in the, the student newspaper or the yearbook? Uh, or? To, to some extent, but not, not too much. But was, was it a family practice to keep, the, keep a diary while you were away or anything? You just no, decided I, to do that? I, no, I had kept a diary quite, for quite a few years when I was, I was in high school oh. and at, you know, at home. So it just naturally... Um, was natural for me to, since I, when I went into service, to keep a record from the day I joined the Navy to, to the day I got out. In your, you, in your, your diary, you, you mentioned some of the medical uh, conditions that you had to, your team had to address with various medications and procedures. Yeah. You got quite a medical education. Oh, no question about it. For, for uh, well, let's see, that was about uh, two and a half, well, it was two and a half years or better. That, that's, that's about all I did was uh, handle sick calls and take care of injuries and... Uh, Seasickness or...? Yeah, we had, we had our share of sick, seasickness. There were some people that, uh, you know, were seasick all the time. If they were really bad, they probably, they were transferred off the ship. But we, uh, we got into some really rough weather, in fact, when we were in off Okinawa, there were th three uh, typhoons that we, what, you know, we take the whole anchor, uh, the ships, and, and just head out to sea and try and run ahead of the, the storms. But we we got into some really really bad uh, weather. Uh, it, we were fortunate that we had they had the experience of the prior year in 1944. We lost three destroyers in the. China, South China Sea with all hands. There were about 500 sailors lost their lives in the, in the typhoon because they sailed right into it instead of, you know, because at that time they didn't have the, the warning. And it had, a year later it had improved somewhat, you know, with weather planes and things like that. So, um, and you had to treat. Um but I never, I, I never was seasick. I, I'd be down below decks in the heat and working and all that, and I, I, I'd get her right up to, to my throat, and then I'd, I'd just go up on deck on a fantail and look out at, to stay myself, look out at the horizon, you know, and sometimes we'd be down in the truck and you could look up at 30 feet up at the waist. Next thing you could look out at the horizon, you couldn't see any water at all. It was just, <laughs> but, but, but you get your uh, equilibrium that way. And, and, and I don't think I ever took, we had 
The only thing we had is the pollen, it was called anti seasickness that, that I, I recall dispensing, but I never used it myself. But um, uh, for the most part, I, I was able to combat the Mal de Mer. <laughs> and then there were cases of dang fever or uh, laryngitis or did somebody have yeah. a circumcision or something? Or Yeah, we, uh, we did. My, our doctor liked to operate, so he'd think of minor operations that he could perform you know, and, and, uh, to keep, keep it in practice, you know, for when he got out of service. And you dispensed lots later, of kind of Later cellar. on, of course, we had a lot of, and then it was suturing we could add from accidents and things. And, Burns, of course, and, but um, and some we had some sailors that came down with pretty bad sicknesses, you know, all the way up to pneumonia. And, but fortunately, we because uh, we had the shots for all the for malaria and uh, cholera and all those diseases. Uh, dysentery and that we didn't didn't really and we weren't weren't ashore that much you know when, when aside from a few liberties we might be weeks before we would get get ashore and, and uh, so but so you arrived in the the front lines as it were Okinawa Iwo Jima yeah, we, we went down, I was telling you about our cruise down to the Caribbean and through the canal. Then we went up to San Diego. While there, I got, I got a short leave. Or, uh, we were only there about three days, as I recall. And I had relatives in LA, so I took the train up there and visited my relatives. And then we... Um, I don't weighed anchor, or I don't know if we were tied, I think we were tied up at that time uh, for Hawaii. And when uh, I, my, I said my brother was at that time, they, they had an excess of Navy flyers, so they, they um, uh, put him in, 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 as a deck officer on a ship, on an LST, and I didn't know this, but we, when I got to Hawaii, he, he, he was there, and when he was, um, I, I forget exactly the situation, but I had a good buddy of mine, a high school uh, friend, uh, named Robert Coleman, who was stationed in Hawaii all during the war, or during the part of the, that he was in. And uh, he knew I was coming out there because we corresponded. So he, he went to meet us and he ran into my brother and then he, uh, so my brother, uh, Pete and I, and Robert Coleman, we were all together in Hawaii. So. Of course, when we had Liberty, we had a good time out in, in, in Honolulu and Waikiki, and we, we didn't stray much from that because we had our regular duties. But we, we had uh, a good, good share of Liberty in that. And while there, we took a training cruise up to, up to Maui, up along the cliffs of Malakai, uh, gunnery practice. It, there was a, one of the ships was they towed these um, uh, what they, I don't know what they call them balloons like well they sleeves and then we uh, behind the ships and then we practice gunnery practice and. Uh, so then, I think we were in Hawaii for about a week, and then we sh we shopped off for for uh, the Philippines, and 
when we reached Anahuitoc, which had been probably six months before taken from the Japs, and I was a bad battle for that little Carl Atoll, you know. And we, we saw the, the sh shredded palm trees, you know, and all that from the ship. And shortly after that, <coughs> our captain told us that, you know, to be more alert and uh, no more horse play anymore because we were in the war zone now. So. Well, we, we got to uh, Samar Island in the eastern Philippines in Leyte, at Leyte Gaul. And the latter, about the last week of August 1940, uh, 44, no, 45. What do you think? Oh, what am I saying? March, in March of 1945. And then uh, about, about the end of March, about March 27th or something like that, we, could, we had a couple of nice liberties ashore in the native villages and things, and uh, that was a, a very interesting, a lot of fun. And it uh, was extremely hot, you know, it was over 100 degrees every day and that, but we, we didn't really mind, you know. And, uh, then we, we took on provisions and more ammo and food and everything, which was a constant thing, of course. And then uh, the latter, about March 27th, something like that, we uh, headed for Okinawa with a huge uh, convoy of troop ships and uh, uh, freighters and all kinds of EKAs, uh, APAs, all the different designations. And then on April 1st, uh, which was Easter Sunday, they also designated it Love Day. That was the invasion of Okinawa. And it was uh, uncontested, which was a surprise, I think, to everyone, you know. And so the, the small boats, uh, I remember the, the morning they, we had a big breakfast and all that for, for the days ahead, steak and eggs and things. And uh, that was one fortunate thing on board ship. We always, we had pretty good food and good cooks and, you know, I always, mostly we, I never, uh, suffered from one of food or that. I think for the most part the crew, some of, some uh, thought at times that, you know, we were short of food and that, but uh, I don't think so. But uh, uh, anyway, I remember that morning it was still and a lot of smoke and it, that was about it because we were out, we were out uh, uh, Away from the from the shore and all that the activity was going on a little further in, but uh, the uh, army landed there uncontested, and the marines and the army went south toward toward where a hundred thousand Japs were dug in along the uh, Naha uh, Shuri Naha Yonaburu the line called there, Shuri Castle. And, uh, it was a rugged area and thousands of caves and then they started slugging it up for the next several months, you know, it was a terrible battle, the last battle. And the Marines just swept up to the north, uh, up to Matubu Peninsula and then they, they were uh, there was a big island of Iashima there, which was heavily fortified. And of course, that was a key point, I think, for J Jap communications and things, because uh, it was north of the island, and when the kamikazes came down and that, they would 
you know, you have contact and with their ships and all that. So, uh, uh, once we were at, we were only at Okinawa for a few days and there was no, no action for us. And then we were sent to Yulipi, which is a big, which enormous atoll that's south. And uh, um, I'm not sure exactly, you know, we escorted other ships down there, whether they were uh, freighters going, you know, uh, going back for more supplies and ammo ships and things, I don't recall, but uh, we, we were escorted, that's what we did. Then we, uh, a few days after that, we were back at Okinawa. We did that uh, twice, uh, plus a trip to Saipan during the first month we were there. But uh, when we were at Okinawa, we were put on this inner screen. They had what they called a screen. The outer screen was mostly destroyers and with more firepower and everything. And they were probably 35, 40 miles out around the whole western side of Okinawa and to intercept the, the uh, Japanese. And uh, we were on an inner screen. And what we, we do is just go uh, travel back and forth in a, in a big, big oval, contact the ships, and there were hundreds of ships doing this, you know. Uh, in our groups, they were APDs, destroyer escorts, patrol craft of different kinds, uh, corvettes, all that type of thing. And uh, the idea was that they, we would intercept the, the planes coming in from, from Japan because we were about 300 miles south of Japan at that point of Kyushu. So on, uh, on April 16, the, 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 uh, we, we watched as our ships bombarded Iwashima and our planes uh, strafed the, uh, and bombed the cone. There was a volcanic cone there, and we could see all that from our ship. And we were, we were cruising back and forth, you know, on the patrol there. And that was the 16th of April, and that was the first. Uh, really large uh, kamikaze attack that we, that we, we uh, encountered. There were, I, as I recall, about 200 suicide planes came down. And they, we, uh, our planes and ships probably splashed uh, about uh, two-thirds or more. Probably. Terminology, splashed means to Knock them yeah, out. we shoot them down. Tell that splashing when you when they shoot down or when a, when a plane would would miss. Well, of course, I guess you wouldn't call when they hit a ship. There was a, it's, they splashed against the ship, and there were of course hundreds of uh, I mean dozens of ships were hit by by suicide planes, and uh, but. There were a great many more ships that were or planes that were either missed the ships or were shot down by the ships and missed the ships, or the the patrol uh, by then, the, especially the uh, F4F uh, uh, Wildcats and the F4U Corsairs. Those Corsairs, they they just going crazy when the jets were, when, it, when there was a big raid, you know. And uh, so we, we were saved many times by, by our air cover, you know, the from planes. Uh, and 
Um, anyway, that, and with, that was the day, the 16th, that big raid that we would, uh, we got our first uh, kill, you might say. That uh, there was a battle with uh, a Japanese patrol plane, I guess, with a fixed landing gear that. Uh, and the all clear had been sounded, I remember, and everybody figured, gee, the battle's over now, because prior to that, we, you know, we were, when, we're, when you're in the midst of a, an attack like that, they put the ship in full speed and, and, and turn it, you know, and you'd, you'd be thrown from one side to the side of the, from one bulkhead to another, and you, you knew that. You know, they were trying to elude these planes. But anyway, we came through that all right. But they just, at the very end, this Jap plane somehow came out. Of it. Well, as I recall, there was a low cover, a cloud cover. And he came down and it was just, I, I can still remember, a few rounds went off. And then he just missed the ship exploded in the water, or crashed in the water. I don't recall that there was an explosion because uh, uh, he was hit so close aboard that uh, if he had exploded, he would, would have had more damage. But uh, that was our, our first encounter with a kamikaze. So. Then, most, most of the activity was in April, May, and June. And during that time, I don't know, four or five thousand kamikazes came down and were either crashed or were shot down or whatever. And there were all kinds of incidents where one, one night uh, a Betty bomber, a uh, medium bomber, Japanese bomber, uh, Flew, flew in and landed on the airfield at Okinawa, and, and uh, the, the uh, Japs poured out of it and destroyed a lot of our planes and that until they killed them all, you know. Uh, they, they did some kind of odd things in that, you know. And there, were, there was a big uh, a, a group of islands called Karama Reto, right off. Uh, there. And we'd go in there to the anchorage uh, with ships that were damaged and some that were, if perhaps they were repairable, you know, uh, they'd be, be at anchor in there. And the Japanese still held some of the, the land there. So they, they had um, Suicide boats, and they had frogmen that had come out and attach explosive devices, and there, there was uh, all kinds of things going on there all the time. But um, uh, sometimes the, the Japs, uh, I remember one evening, a Jap plane flew right between a group of our ships, and everybody started firing, you know, at this plane. And the shells were exploding, you know, above each ship. <laughs> so it was, it was a pretty dangerous situation. And then, uh, uh, I don't know what dates it was, there was another. We, we were very lucky because on at least three occasions, we were changed our screening position and the ship took, took over and was hit by it. Uh, by one or more kamikazes. You know. But anyway, the uh, second time we, uh, did, of course, every every night you go to, uh, you know, part of every day you'd be at battle stations, sometimes for hours, sometimes for a short time, or you'd go to battle stations and, and uh, uh, for an hour, and then they they blow the all clear, and you go back to your bunks or whatever. And about ten minutes later, all hands <laughs> man your battle stations again. So 
we would sometimes we're up all night, you know, like it all depended, but uh, it, it uh, was kind of spooky. And uh, uh, one night we, we were we were attacked by two planes simultaneously, and I remember the the on the I could even tell it was the start of the port bow, and I heard heard our five inch gun go off, you know, boom, boom, boom. They, they could fire that thing pretty fast. And then when the 40 millimeters, you know, boom, 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 start going off, you knew he was getting close. And then the 20 millimeters, that was, they were like big machine guns. And at the same time, another plane came in the stir, uh, on our stern. And uh, I think most of our, well, on the port side and the bow and the stern, uh, were all looking at this guy coming in. And uh, this guy was sneaking up from behind us because we had, they had put big davits on there for loading supplies and things on our fantail. They took off uh, most of the uh, uh, ash cans that they used. We had about a hundred when it was a DE. I think we, were, we had a dozen left, so there was room to have carry jeeps or supplies or anything on it. Big, pretty big fan tail. Plus there were these booms for um, loading cargo, unloading cargo. And I, I didn't mention when they they we had four LCBPs, uh, landing boats, and davits on their ship on the, when they converted them, and that made us pretty top heavy because those things, I don't know how many tons each, you know. That. So when we got in rough weather in that, or when we were maneuvering, you know, we, we'd heel over and you'd, you'd think we were going to capsize at times, so especially in these typhoons. The ship would heel over and hang there, you know, and then it'd go back, all the way back to the other way, you know, and that. Uh, it, it was pretty scary. But anyway, uh, these jet, two jet planes attacked us at the same time, and either one or both of them were blew up right, right on top of us, and it, it, we were 2,200 tons or something, and it lifted. I remember it lifted the ship right up out of the water. And then we. We heeled over and hung there for a long time, and then slowly went. And there was all the smoke and, and smell. Of, I was up. Uh, my, my duty was up near the officers' quarters there during battle, and I remember the smell of all the uh, aftershave and things like that. You know, what you could combine with. And then I, I remember running over to the hatch going down to see what was doing down in the engine rooms and, and uh, everything was turmoil down there but uh, not, we didn't have, we had some damage to the ship but uh, very little. There were one of the uh, radar or radio men got hit with a piece of equipment I remember. But uh, as far as we we came out of that smelling like a rose, let's say. For, for, so that was when we got our two two planes, and then um, the last one in in between. Well, well, I I should mention we went. Is that okay. Mm -hmm. We went, we went out one night, the USS Little, a destroyer had been sunk out on the outer picket line, and we went out to pick up survivors. We didn't get any off the Little, but we uh, got survivors from, from another destroyer uh, that had been sunk or badly damaged, or anyway from other ships. Um, 
and we had um, casualties aboard, burn, burn casualties primarily, and we had one body that we picked up out of the water. But that, that was extremely scary because we came alongside and we were still under attack and uh, pulled alongside uh, this other destroyer to transfer the, the, uh, transferred the casualties to us. And we were dead in the water, you know, and that, that is really scary when you're, when you're under attack. Um, then uh, we worked all that night and the following morning with the casualties, you know, from, the, from the, uh, that. But um, then that's, I guess it was, I'm not sure if it was that night or the following evening, we, we uh, got hit by a, another Kapakati. And, and uh, he blew up, you know, all over the ship. And so we had, um, no, I actually, I'm, I'm thinking, um, this was this was another. It had nothing to do with the little in there. There was, there was survivors. That I, I just mentioned it. But it, it, anyway, the third time this was near the end of April, I think, when when we our fourth uh, suicide plane uh, hit us, and uh, we had about. Fortunately, we only had. Uh, ten injured, you know, mostly shrapnel and burns and, and but there were the force of the explosion and the, the ship was covered with parts of the plane and the pilots, in fact, you could smell the stench of the mm. pilot that, uh, or pilot, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's one or two, uh, probably one whether it was a zero or whatever it was for weeks afterward, you know, and we had pieces of the planes, you know, thousands of pieces of aluminum. And I, I brought a piece home about a foot long and I had it for years at home and, and then my mother threw it out, you know, and that is a memento. But uh, anyway, uh, we, we were fortunate. We, we never lost uh, a single person killed. Uh, two of the officers subsequently received uh, purple hearts, and about half a dozen of the crew and you know that uh, were but gunners mates mostly, I think, that were that were injured, but. Um, Oh, okay, then that same evening, the APD Barry, uh, it, in that book, you, you know, that it tells about the Barry, was hit the same evening, and that it had been abandoned, and it, it was an inferno, you know, and uh, I think probably that was, well, couldn't say but one of the scariest because we st we still had our casualties aboard and, and we uh, the cat at that point we were the flagship we had the Commodore uh, aboard our ship we were the flagship of our group and somebody decided you know to go and save the ferry and um, uh, so we pulled alongside it with all our fire fit and fighting equipment and guys went and their own crew was part of it, was circling around <laughs> telling us that it, because they were afraid, and so were we, that the thing was going to blow up. You know. And, uh, but we fought that thing till like three or four in the morning, and there were uh, a couple of other ships came and laid down smoke screens. And I think at one point we heard Jap planes circling around looking, 
for targets, you know, we were sitting in the water uh, fighting the fires on, on, the, on the barrel. But uh, before daylight, they, they did get the thing under control, and it, uh, it was towed ashore and stripped. And then, unfortunately, while they were towing it out to, as a decoy, because it was so badly damaged, a jab sunk it in the tow ship, you know. Uh, just happened to come by, I guess, and saw these slow, slow moving ships going out there. They were going to anchor it out there as a decoy. But, uh, well, so that's, that's how it went. There's all kinds of stories and things. It was, uh, we had, the Navy had a lot of, in the early days, the Navy suffered, you know, hundreds of casualties because so many ships were hit and sunk. And, and these large, the destroyer, I mean, the cruisers and battle ships were sitting <coughs> off the island, lob thousands and thousands of shells into Okinawa to help the troops, the, the army there. and. Uh, I remember one Jap plane flew down the funnel of, I think it was in New Mexico, and exploded inside the ship there. And uh, there were there were a lot of, right near the end there, we, we anchored one night. We went over to the east side of the island, which we rarely did, but for some reason we were over there and anchored. And when we got up in the morning, right next to us, the, the pence, the, Battleship Pennsylvania was was uh, uh, at anchor there, and the stern was down in the water, and it had been tor torpedoed a couple of nights before. And this this was very late, and uh, somehow a Jap torpedo plane got through. And uh, as I recall, there were eighteen quartermasters were killed which was probably all they had on the battleship. And af shortly after that, I think they started dispersing the, the various uh, uh, groups of uh, technicians and things so that in the event of a hit like that, you know, they wouldn't lose everything. So. But um, anyway, that's the way the thing went. I don't know. If we went to the back to the Philippines at least once, you know. Oh, I we, we went to Saipan. We escorted them. I remember the group of the ships. They were all missing guns or big holes in them and things, you know. We a whole. We convoyed a whole group of daily ships back to, to Saipan at one time. And uh, uh, when I think back on it, you know, we, we were on the same, same course from Okinawa to, to um, Leyte that the Indianapolis was taking when, when this Jap submarine sank it, you know. And it, so maybe they. We were in their sights at one time because we made so, because uh, but they figured we were too small to wait for a big ship to come along. I don't know, just conjecture. But anyway, uh, near the end of August, uh, we re we remembered a big um, celebration uh, when when. Uh, DE Day, that was, that was way back, that was in June, and uh, uh, what other, oh, well, I guess when they dropped the bomb in oh. Hiroshima, that, that was a, and, it, and there was just incredible celebrations, and the, thousands and thousands of guns, you know, I was, I'm, I'm sure there were a lot of casualties from, from our own uh, I think you mentioned that there were 
36 men killed or wounded in celebrating the surrender. Yeah, and, and there was, it was, it, they finally had to tell everybody, you know, cease fire because uh, I'm sure they probably didn't know what the hell was going on. I, you know, those troops in the, in the trenches there, and they were fighting. And, and, uh, but it, it was a real Fourth of July celebration, I'll tell you, everybody. All the ships were firing, and all the guns they were. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, at the end of August, we white anchor or so we went up near Japan and rendezvoused with uh, a British uh, fleet up there, the King George V and uh, a couple of Australian destroyers uh, uh, landing parties came came to our ship and uh, then Finally, we were, everybody was waiting, you know, to see for the Japanese surrender, and it didn't seem to seem to take forever. And then, so we we anchored in Sagami Bay, a big bay outside of Tokyo Bay, which is enormous, of course. And uh, that was interesting. We were sitting there at anchor under these big jam naval guns and. And the t troops were, all the volleys were still manned in that, you know, and, and uh, it was kind of interesting. And uh, then finally we got the word, you know, to, get, to, get, to go in, and we took uh, these British and New Zealand troops uh, into uh, Yosuka, the big Japanese naval base or one of them, and uh, occupied a big naval warehouse there, and, and these small boats all day long were going in there and coming back with the, they lift up the floorboards and they had just a, a, an unimaginable array of guns and uniforms and silverware and er, everything you might, might imagine, you know, swords and, there and so everybody was. Uh, in fact, I I don't recall, but I, I thought I had one of those Nambu machine guns at one time. But um, I indicated there that I think that uh, that I had it. Some some other weapon, I don't know, a sword. Sword, so, yeah. Well, I did eventually get a get a sword. I had it at home. My dad had it in his office. One of these officers curved uh, uh, samurai swords, they called them, and I carried that thing. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we, uh, with all the armament that, uh, that we had aboard, all the guns and swords and things, most of them got thrown overboard because we thought when we got it, they confiscated when we got back to the States eventually. And, uh, but I, I kept my sword and I, I had it sticking out of my duffel bag because it was, you know, a long sword. You know, all the way through the, through New York and on the trains and everything and no one ever said boo about it. So I don't know. But anyway, um, after, it, it was very interesting there at the naval at the uh, naval base, and then uh, a few days later we took a contingent of Marines over to a naval air station at uh, Takayama Naval Air Station on Tokyo Bay, and that was again very interesting. There was a, uh, the Japanese were still there on their uniform of course and everything and um, this was a couple of days before the surrender I think which was what September 2nd and um, then I remember it was a, a Japanese shrine there and it, apparently it had been 
there had been ceremonies for kamikaze pilots on their last flights and that because there were there were I remember that who had the there were a lot of pictures of Japanese pilots, you know, laying around and and uh, the shrine had been pretty well desecrated. And, um, uh, we weren't supposed to, I, I picked up a scroll which I said somewhere in Japan now. I kept it for many, many years and then uh, I finally sent it, went to the Japanese, uh, not the embassy, what do they call it? Consulate? Pardon? The consulate? The Japanese yeah, consulate? in Chicago. Yeah. And, and they, uh, and it w went back to Japan. It was to hopefully the same place. You know. and it, it listed the names of all. It, it went back way back into the 30s, you know, this big scroll for different ceremonies and things that had occurred there at the shrine, at this uh, Shinto shrine. Um, and then, um, well, later on we went, we went to Yokohama, which is another big part of Tokyo Bay there. And that's where we finally got ashore and saw, saw the buildings and that they're pretty ramshackle and everything, you know, all, but there, there wasn't much war damage there. But uh, then later in the month, uh, we went, we anchored at Tokyo, but not, and we went by uh, jeeps or buses, I don't recall what, in, into the, we, we rode for mile after mile after mile through the through the um, desolation from the fire bombing. You know, there was nothing there for just uh, thousands and thousands of acres and it just charred ruins. You know, and people living under metal sheets and things. And um, uh, but we finally got into the heart of Tokyo and that, that was very interesting and we we wandered around all over through the business district, you know, and that one day we uh, uh, we were at the Daishi building when General MacArthur came out and there was a huge crowd. We didn't know this, but we went over and joined it and had the intersection blocked and everything, you know. And uh, I always remember it was an extremely beautiful Japanese girl in the most gorgeous kimonos, you know, there in the group, and, and uh, uh, little things like that you know, you, 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 you remember. And I remember uh, the general came out, you know, and I uh, saluted everybody and got in his, in his uh, car and took off. And we, we spent a lot of time in the parks around, around the uh, uh, Diet building and the uh, Imperial Palace and the moats and, and uh, we, we wander in it everywhere and there was no, no indication of The, the Japs would be standing around in groups, still in uniform and everything, and and uh, there was seemed to be no animosity of any kind, you know. And that we, we couldn't speak to each other; we just look at each other, and walk by, you know. And uh, there wasn't wasn't much to buy or uh, that, and we ch traded cigarettes, which would cost a nickel a pack, you know, for, uh, for uh, some things. And uh, our, uh, our, the doctor and some others uh, went up by jeep into the hills. Well, I, no, I think that was when we were down on the inland sea. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, was, it was really interesting to see what, uh, as far as we could determine, you know, it looked like the Japs were really dumb, you know. They, I, I can't imagine that they could have put up 
much for defense or would have wanted to, even if, uh, if the uh, emperor hadn't told him to quit. But once he told him to quit, they, they were out of it completely. It was just, you know, brothers again. So, um, oh, there were, I remember at uh, Yokohama, there were these, with the big, these uh, uh, Japanese uh, midget sub pens, midget subs, and you know, all uh, being built there, and these ca caves that uh, we walked for miles, and they were really spooky because. Uh, but apparently they've been checked or they would have been blocked if there was any danger of booby trapping and things. But they were, they were wet and spooky and dark. And we, there were rows of American milling machines and drill presses and all the things, all you know, things. And uh, uh, so we, we just bumming around, you know, when we were on Liberty, and then we'd be back to the ship, and then um, so we we saw a nice part of Tokyo, what was left of Tokyo, the business district. But um, then we got orders to take a survey of atomic people, experts down to Hiroshima. So we. This, this was, um, well, let's see, it would have been probably in October, and we were down there for a couple of months um, at Curry at the huge naval base, and that, that was interesting from the standpoint of all the ships and planes and things that had, or the remains of them that were there from, from the war, you know. To, uh, battleships and cruisers and all types of big float planes and all that that had been shot up and crashed. And, uh, uh, and then we had wonderful liberties. On, on, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous area. That, that inland sea is the prettiest part of the world down there with the, all the islands and the rice paddies, you know, and the, for, the pine forests. And, and uh, it's uh, really pretty. And we we hike. Uh, we had one little island in particular we went to, and uh, we we hiked to these pine up uh, these paths, and there were all these machine gun uh, dugouts all the way up there, and at the top was a big uh, anti aircraft emplacements and that. The trees were all hanging with tinsel, which our planes dropped to jam their, their radar, jam their, their guns. Um, and uh, we played baseball, and we had, had our ration of beer while we supported. That was another. I remember my next door neighbor, he was. He was in the army. He just died recently. Uh, was in in the army in the South Pacific, and uh, he was telling us about when they came out. They were relieved, I think, at Guadalcanal by uh, did the Marine, the army, go in first. Well, anyway, wherever they were, they were going back. They were finally relieved and going back to the shore. When we got back there, there were some U.S. Navy ships there, and these guys just went aboard and went into the stores and took all the beer and then drank it, and nobody, everybody, they were just such a bedraggled, dirty, rotten mess of guys that came out of the jungles there that nobody <laughs> bothered uh, arguing with them, you know, and that. And he said later on, no, they got charged by lady <laughs> for the beer. But we were fortunate to have our beer rations. Played a lot of baseball. Uh, but mostly just wandered around. And 
most of the little villages and things were off limits because you know, we would have made a shambles of them with all the guys there. And one day, uh, the officers, uh, our, kid, our doctor, a couple of the other officers, took me on a, a ride through Hiroshima. This was about a month after the bomb was dropped. That, that was a, an experience, an unbelievable experience, because one couldn't fathom that one bomb had done all that. You know, and that was nothing compared to it. And after that, we went back to, uh, back again up to Tokyo Bay, and then we took on provisions and things. Oh, I sh should say something about the mail. We'd, we'd get mail pre pretty good. In fact, my brother was on the mail ship, the LSD 890 at, uh, at Okinawa, so I, I saw him quite quite often, or not quite often, but a number of times, and he came to our ship once when we'd go in for supplies or uh, ammo, whatever. Uh, or fuel, and uh, sometimes the mail would come through pretty good, but then there, were, there was one one period there at Okinawa where we didn't get any mail for weeks, and when it came, there were thousands of letters, you know. And, uh, you, I mean, you got uh, 30 letters in one yeah, day, is that yeah, right? Yeah, one day. Yeah. So, a lot of catching up to doing things. But anyway, from from there, um, we sa sailed uh, over to, we stopped at Midway Island, and then went down the chain to, to Hawaii, and uh, uh, from Hawaii, uh, we, I think we stopped in San Diego again, and then went down to the canal and then back up to, and it, our home port we thought would be Norfolk, but it ended up being New York, which was really nice. And we, New York at that time was really wide open as far as safety and everything was concerned. And we'd have, we'd have liberty, you know, from, till I think five in the morning, as I recall. So we, we'd go, go out at like 7 in the evening, we go to Greenwich Village, we go all over and went to the downtown at the USO and see all the, all the museums and the, way the USO provided us with all the tickets for all kinds of things going on, you know, and all that, whether ice shows or, or uh, uh, opera or uh, music, musical events of all different kinds and, and of course the dance halls and uh, it was a wonderful experience from did you want uh, well any, anything as far as tell we then after uh, after New York uh, eventually, this was in January of 1946, and I, I got uh, leave and went home during that time. And uh, then we went down to Norfolk and to Savannah, Georgia, and, or to uh, Charleston, and then finally to uh, Savannah where I was left the ship, was left the Navy, so that was, that was my year and a half cruise in the Pacific, but it, I, if there's something else you want to ask me, anything that I may have, uh, any particular Chuck, that what, there's a reference to, um, I mean, in the history books you hear about Tokyo Rose, but you had a reference to Lion Lou. Yeah, Who's I, that? Were, this had to be another person. It, it was uh, 
that would broadcast to us and tell us, uh, you know, how many ships had been, of our ships had been hit by them the night before and things like that, you know, to try and, and but I, I never heard Tokyo Rose uh, that I know of, um, but uh, this was evidently another one of those broadcasters. But, And you learned to play chess in the Pacific, was it? Yeah, yeah. And you became and good at it? Near, near the end, I started uh, to play bridge. And I can play a little bridge today. I only play about once a year when we go to Colorado, because my, my wife's in the bridge club, but she doesn't want me as partner. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 a few weeks ago, I did, did play. Uh, I, her partner didn't show up, so she corralled me and I played. It worked out okay. But Pinochle was my big game, the one. We, we have tournaments all the time going on there. And we played a lot of cribbage, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't even know anymore how to play cribbage, but Pinochle I still, still was my game. Uh, so during the war, you. Uh, Forge friendships with other people in the service. Were you able to maintain those through the years, or did they change? In well, civilian see, life? when when we came out, everybody went their way all over the country, and uh, mo most of them, or a lot of them, went to college and then started working and raising families. And it it must have been oh maybe like. Twenty years ago, when finally we started uh, our ship, we had um, our purser, a guy by the name of, uh, his name was Purser actually, he was a, uh, on our ship, uh, he, he started a newspaper. And he mailed that out and everybody would contribute to it. And that, that went on for quite a few years. At the same time, they, we had reunions, uh, probably about uh, oh, half a dozen or eight of them, uh, various places all, all across the country. I, I never went to any of the reunions, but I, I contributed to the paper and had kept in touch in that. But as far as really, uh, I never I met one one of the people that was on our ship who had a daughter out in one of the western suburbs. I met him a couple of times, but other than that, I never never really met any of the people. Um, although if I'd gone on these reunions, you know, it, it would have been uh, I would have kept in close contact with a lot. Of so Chuck. Um did you have any, you didn't have any young men, you didn't have too much, too, and welcomed home, you didn't have too much difficulty adjusting to, to life after the war, and then you decided to go to college then, or you yeah, went to college? Yeah, well, as soon as I came home, I, I got out, uh, what, in April? Yeah, of, uh, in September I was at college, so. Was Were you able to use the GI Bill at that time? Oh, or? yeah, yeah. Everybody was going to school under the GI Bill. And when you got to really nice, you, they pay your tuition and uh, board and everything. Plus, I think we got fifty dollars a month expenses. It was a marvelous thing, you know. Uh, I think the the American Legion was instrumental in getting the GI Bill passed, and my dad, I know, was a really strong supporter of it because it was it was nip and tuck they, they had to rush people in to for the vote in congress to finally approve it and, and uh, it nearly didn't happen but it transformed the entire country you know because all these thousands of gis got got the college educations and went on to build the country a lot of what it is today. Uh, uh, the 
so so called great <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like it. Were you? It sounds <laughs> like it. <laughs> but uh, so, what college did you did you go to then, Chuck? I went to Boyd College. And did you major in something medical after all this? No, oh, I, I, didn't. I took I took uh, uh, pre-made courses in that, but I I don't know. I just uh, didn't. I I was more interested in archaeology, anthropology, and geology. I I probably could have uh, a few more courses, and I would have been a geologist instead of. But I ended up uh, in the insurance business. I worked for 30 years with for all state insurance. So. <coughs> but um, you know, once you're, you you get married and that, and then you you get tied into a job and that, and kind of. But I've always kept my hand in, so to speak, because when I was in school, I. I spent three summers uh, excavating in Wisconsin and North Dakota and Indiana, Indian uh, villages and things. And so it was interesting. I'm just thinking as we sit here, um, if I've got this right, 60 years ago today would have been March 15, 1945, and you were Probably in the in the Pacific then. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were we were probably somewhere out near near the Philippines then. Well, thank you for being able to uh, to take us back there. Yeah, if, you, if, you can, uh, if there's anything you want to talk about, uh, I, I'll be glad. But I don't know what there is. There's, there's so much detail and things and you have. Well, thanks for being uh, available for, uh, for follow-up interviews if they're necessary. You had an expression in the book, Mobs of Gobs. Does that refer to anything, Re reference mobs to soldiers, of mobs. mobs of Gobs? Is that? No, it doesn't. Yeah. I've read a lot of books on the Navy and World War II, and, but not, not that particular one. Okay. There have been some. I don't. I don't know what. Uh, you, you did. Um, as we wind up, or you did have some. You did meet a lot of interesting people, soldiers from different countries, and you. You seemed like you had good things to say about the Limeys and the. Uh, yeah, the Aussies. They, They're all. In we. We got on really well for the short time they were with us, and that. And, you know, we talk about. Of what they did during the war and all that—it <laughs> was—it was, uh, was interesting to have them, and it, it was a real piece of history to have taken those troops off of them and to have seen the, the King George V, you know, one of the old battle wagons. At that time, we were we were building the the uh, Iowa and. The, yeah, of course, that's where. Oh, the day the peace was signed, you know, we were. I don't know, maybe ten miles from the from the uh, Iowa. Was that no? Let's say from the desert when the, when the peace was signed, and uh, in fact, I think I indicated I was uh, getting ready for inspection in the sick bay at the time, you know, so. But the, that was the, the, uh, that was unbelievable. The hundreds and hundreds of aircraft, every conceivable type of American plane flying around in that area, and ships by the hundreds, you know, of every type, and all the newest battle wagons, you know, and cruisers and destroyers, and even our little ship was there. It, it, it was. Uh, it was wonderful to uh, a wonderful experience, really, and probably the highlight of my life that those two and a half years. That, um, and, um, um, 
never forget any of that because that's people will say you know forget it it's bygones but it's all still there because that that's something you remember in detail Uh, when the Sims uh, came in from the Atlantic, uh, the captain of the ship, Louis Andrews, uh, went ashore. We got the new captain, whom I didn't mention, uh, Donahue was his name, big, tall Irishman. And uh, uh, Mr. Andrews compiled subsequently the story of all of the destroyer escorts in World War II. The book uh, was published, uh, Tempest, Fire, and Foe, and uh, in it there is uh, a section which uh, tells about our experiences uh, fighting the fires aboard the, uh, again, on the Barry, and um, I would recommend this book to anybody. And we have the book here at the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, we have the book here at the library, and I have a place in history because... <laughs> Great! <laughs> As you deserve. <laughs> because my name is in the... Um, what do they call this? <laughs> The index. The index. So, yep. Well, I guess that's what. Yet, unless you have something else. Thank you very much.